thoracoabdominal emergencies. I like to color code things by organ. You can see this is how we will break this down. The first group are thoracic emergencies, the next group intestinal emergencies, and lastly, viscous and vessel emergencies. I'm, if you've seen my presentations before, they're usually just straight case presentation, but I thought some additional information about the pathologies we'll be viewing would be helpful for people so you'll see I have the a typical age range and gender distribution, pink for female, blue for male, white for equal in both genders, right? We will do the annual incidence of each of these pathologies per 100,000, that's in green on the second line. I will present icons representing the risk factors in red, the percentage mortality, uh, for that entity. And then last, the CT sensitivity. All of these stats were taken from the uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information. Next, another case of infectious endocarditis. This is a slightly different manifestation, but again, 30 to 55, 15 per 100,000. Your risk factors, mortality 20% in hospital, 40% first year, and a sensitivity of 98%. Again, not buying that, but. All right, this is a great one. This is an aortic infection, and we don't actually have a vegetation to point to. And as I said, that is the definitive thing that you really want to see if you're going to call this absolutely endocarditis. However, there is a finding here that is as valuable and as definitive. And that is this erosion into the uppermost portion of the muscular septum, right there adjacent to the aortic valve, in fact, anterior to it, this is the spot where you get these. This is a, a, a ring abscess adjacent to the aortic valve ring. And this one, when I give this live, I always pimp the crowd. How do these patients present? They present with heart block because the AV node sits right there where that uh, infection is eroding. So that is a ring abscess. You note also there is hypodense pericardial fluid, which in this case is almost certainly pyopericardium. And if you needed any further convincing, look at these wedge-shaped hypodensities in the kidneys and in the spleen, classic peripheral wedge-shaped hypodensities consistent with uh, microvascular infarcts. And note also, it's going on in the liver. It's just a little less apparent in this contrast phase, but you can see a wedge-shaped hypodensity there as well. All right, the most important finding here is that erosion into the muscular septum right there, adjacent to the aorta. That is just a definitive finding for infectious aortic endocarditis and uh, a risk factor for heart block, as mentioned. And here are the liver, the kidney, and lastly, the spleen hypodensities. Let's look at that one one more time. There's the ring abscess, note throughout the pyopericardium. And then the liver, kidney, and splenic infarcts. The radiologist that made this call said, boy, this one just kept giving. Uh, the more he looked, the more things he found. Here it is on the coronal. You can see anterior to the valve ring there. And there are those renal infarcts. All right, so that's a case of aortic infectious endocarditis. Okay. Our next case is an atrial septal defect. These are most common in women over 40. Annual incidence of 50 per 100,000, so pretty common. None of these risk factors is very firm, but for the most part, people are trying to pin it on the mother, heredity or 
alcohol, uh, gestational diabetes, or smoking during pregnancy. Uh, very weak associations, though all of them, to tell you the truth, pretty unsatisfying in terms of uh, uh, predicting in whom these will arise. And a lethality of only about 7%, and usually with the complication that we'll be demonstrating, and a 95% sensitivity on CT. All right, so here we have a few pulmonary arterial filling defects. There's one in the left pulmonary artery, which is enlarged, and there's one in the right. And there is the culprit. There is a large atrial septal defect there. And you can see we have right to left shunting. There is right heart enlargement, and that's related to the chronic left to right shunting that normally exists in this condition. So this is an ASD with Eisenmenger syndrome. So what has happened is the patient had a pulmonary embolism that increased the right-sided pressures and caused right to left shunting across that ASD. Pretty unusual to catch this on a CT, but there you have it. Now this patient, of course, is at risk for paradoxical embolism, right? With that right to left shunting, if they were to have another PE come along, that could potentially shoot over into the left-sided circulation. So the pulmonary arterial filling defects, note the size of the pulmonary arteries. They are quite large, obviously due to the recirculation, the uh, high volume of chronic left to right shunting. And there is that right to left shunting across the ASD and a very large and a little hypertrophic uh, right ventricle as well. Let's look at that one more time. Wispy filling defects there in the left, more convincing ones there on the right. In that right to left shunting, what a treat. <laughs> Okay, that's an ASD with Eisenmenger syndrome. Next one is another ASD. So women over 40, 50 per 100,000, uh, weak maternal misbehavior associations, and a mortality of about 7%. 94% sensitivity on CT. That might be overstated as well. So this is the one that goes all the way. This is the uh, paradoxical embolism related to an ASD and precipitated by pulmonary embolism. So here you can see the aortic filling defect that actually descends down from the left subclavian. It's pretty impressive and uh, looks like a stick man. It's not common enough for me to try and coin a finding name, but I can't help but think it every time I look there. All right, and these are the pulmonary emboli. So of course, what happened here is there was significant pulmonary embolism that increased the right-sided pressure and led to right-to-left shunting. Now, I've gone over this one time and time again. You'd like to point at this guy and call it uh, some kind of shunting. Ultimately, I had to determine it's just artifacts. So we don't actually see the shunting here, but you can appreciate the right side of the heart is large. In fact, that was one of the uh, first things I noted when I opened this case. So you can tell there's already been chronic left to right shunting just by uh, virtue of that in this relatively younger patient. So again, here's that left subclavian leading to an aortic filling defect. Obviously, this is the complication you really don't want when you have an ASD. And there's that enlarged right heart, which you can appreciate all throughout. So there it is again. takes pretty large pulmonary emboli to uh, precipitate this. Obviously, you have to have a pretty abrupt and dramatic rise in pulmonary pressures. All right, so that was a case of ASD with paradoxical embolism. Next, an aortic dissection. 
He's most common men between 50 and 65. The incidence is thankfully fairly low, about three per 100,000. The main risk factors are hypertension and smoking. The mortality is an impressive 75%. Although, if it is known and handled non-emergently, it's about 48%. Uh, so if it's previously diagnosed and being monitored and you present with acute symptoms in a timely fashion, uh, you have about uh, just about a 50% chance of making it. But those folks that present uh, just de novo out in the wild, uh, they do very poorly. And that's uh, kind of similar to uh, aortic aneurysm rupture, which we'll see later. And the CT is very sensitive for this. 99%, in fact, is what it's given. I have to agree with that. Actually, uh, our QA data suggests that this while devastating if missed, uh, is not very frequently missed uh, by our radiologists. They're, of course, at VRAD, pretty tuned to emergent conditions. But there is the linear filling defect. You can see there's even a little fenestration there. So we're going to have contrast on both sides in the false and the true lumens. And there is the lower portion of the flap again with a fenestration in it, just starting right above the aortic valve, as so many of these do. Now there's rupture into the mediastinum right at the base here, probably coming from the false lumen. You can see the blood is uh, extravascular there and headed down into the pericardium. And that's uh, one of the dread complications of this entity is rupture into the pericardium. You can see this is a hemopericardium. It's extraordinary. That's interesting how it's pinched there. It most likely is due to the presence of clot throughout the pericardium. Uh, that's why it, it looks that way. You'll see uh, acute extravasation often kind of burrow a path through pre-existing clot, give the impression of loculation or, uh, or even a vessel when truly there is none. You can see the compression there on the right side of the heart. It's practically vanishing. All right, so there again is that linear filling defect with a fenestration, and then another fenestration at its base. There's that rupture with leakage into the pericardium. All right, I will briefly tell my story of the acute rupture. I actually uh, witnessed one of these where the patient ruptured in the ICU. Everyone knew uh, that she had a large aortic dissection and that this was the risk. Uh, so she tamponaded right in front of all of us. And as witnesses to it, we were able to get a very large syringe and do a pericardiocentesis on the spot. And I pulled uh, several hundred cc's of bright red blood out of that woman's pericardium, uh, sequentially throwing syringes to the floor. And ultimately, she basically exsanguinated. So uh, the, I guess the take home message is, even if this happens to you in the ICU and people that expect it are watching, uh, it's very unlikely that you'll survive. Well, this patient had additional trouble. You can see there's some gas surrounding the supraclavicular uh, vessels here. And down in the mediastinum, again, there's mediastinal gas and there is a ruptured posterior tracheal membrane there. This is a complication of either not pulling back the uh, stylet from inside the tube or overinflation of the balloon, which I kind of suspect here because you can see the turgid appearance there of the balloon. Uh, overinflating the balloon is, uh, is really probably the more common reason because mo most of us are trained to pull that, uh, that stylus back automatically when we open the tube package. So this is a very unfortunate patient uh, with hemopericardium and a tracheal rupture. 